Hi, my name is Nick Jankel and I am going to share with you some thoughts, some approaches, some methodologies, some principles, some practices, some theory about how to cope with the crisis we all face, how to engage with the pandemic and how to approach this intense experience both personally but also as leaders of organizations institutions and of course as co-creators of the global social and economic system that we all manifest with all our needs and wants and desires and actions i've been asked quite a few times in the last few weeks as the coronavirus started to hit to share some thoughts with the community of people who engage in my work and the work of my business switch on leaders individuals um, on our various different social platforms email lists um, and the wider world and i haven't because i wanted to really eat my own dog food slash caviar and you will decide over the next few videos to process it fully myself as much as i can what's going on and what i think is occurring and now i'm ready to share with you some thoughts but they're not just any thoughts they're actually some structured thoughts because over the last 30 years and i literally mean 30 years um, from really my first psychotherapy session as a 13 year old um, around that time to reading philosophy to studying medicine at cambridge studying philosophy of science uh, at cambridge um, moving into mass behavior change um, in advertising moving into my own business um, as an innovation consultant and then leadership consultant and now transformation um, consultant, program runner, book writer, author. I've been working on what is now my life's work, which is a theory, it's a philosophy, it's a metaphysics, it's a practice set, a tool set, an approach for transforming things. And when I say things, what I predominantly mean is ourself. Um, so that's the work of psychological or more accurately psycho-spiritual development, self-development, awareness development, leadership development, and then how we transform the entities of which we are part that deliver product services, policies, procedures into the world, enterprises, organizations. And it's the transformation therefore of systems. Systems only transform when the people and the players, the agents, the institutions within them transform. And in fact, if we want to change the world and be part of the change and all that kind of thing, we realize the only way you can change the world for the better, which is definitely an opportunity right now, um, a big opportunity, a massive opening opportunity. We have to change the things that occur in the world, which are best changed through the organizations of people that come together to deliver things into the world. And we call them companies, institutions, organizations, enterprises. It could be a tiny startup, a micro business uh, like ours is, um, or it could be the NHS or um, a global government or the UN. The way the systems change is through organizations. But organizations only change because when people change, because organizations are simply um, a constellation of human uh, individual thoughts, feelings, actions, um, coming through in culture, in business models, operating models, um, social change models. So my work um, in developing this life's work uh, is about how to change self and how to change the system at the same time. Um, as Isaac Newton had on his desk, apparently, the immortal worlds as above, so below. Um, as the system changes, fractally it's the same process for an individual to change. As an individual changes, um, it's uh, a fractal representation, a self-similar representation of how systems change. And so I'm going to share with you in a number of lectures or webinars, tutorials, I don't know what they are, uh, I don't know how many because it's going to unfold as I share with you um, how this life's work, which has become known now as biotransformation theory, or BTT, can help you engage with this crisis meaningfully, purposefully, fully, and take it inside you and metabolize it. And I'll come back to all these ideas uh, into value that you then can give to people to ameliorate the suffering of those you love, to create value in the world through your enterprise, and ultimately to transform this system. Because we do seem to have a once in a lifetime, maybe once in a generation, maybe once in a species opportunity right now 
through and unto an unfolding of this pandemic and related crises, which I'll come onto again soon, an opportunity to recalibrate, recast our system, to transform it um, into something that works for everyone and the planet. And this is really uh, an important moment for us all. Um, and the theory of biotransformation theory has seven principles, which we call seven gems. They're more than principles, they're um, principles and, and lenses and frameworks. Uh, seven gems of which I'm going to share with you them all during these videos. Um, I've written down seven, I'll share with you what they are in a minute. But first of all, I want to explain how biotransformation theory um, came about, or really what it's generated through and by. So, entering psychotherapy as a young teenager, um, I was trying to ask and answer the question, how can I deal with my life's challenges so far? Um, divorce and um, uh, aggression and disconnection and um, various different ill health issues I had, um, issues with my past, with my childhood, but also dealing with um, very real effects of a family that had gone through the Holocaust. Um, two of my grandparents um, had survived um, one Nazi Germany, one Nazi or fascist Romania and escaped. That's why I'm here, uh, one of the reasons why I'm here. Um, and from that moment, I've been asking that question to myself. How do I transform myself, my beliefs, uh, my stories, uh, my feelings, not just my feelings, my interoceptive uh, felt sense, my sensations in my gut and my chest and my heart that lie underneath a lot of feelings, um, my emotions, um, and therefore my behaviours, my actions in the world. Um, because I wanted to have relationships that worked with my family, with lovers and intimate experiences. Um, I wanted to be happy. I wanted to also do something good in the world. So I went to medical school. Um, after that, I wanted to be a psychiatrist, taking psychology to its, what I thought, natural high point. Um, through studying medicine, studying myself, learning about myself, um, and ultimately going back into something people would call clinical depression, panic attacks, anxiety, um, failed relationships, um, obesity. I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, um, which um, I've had since then. I realized that psychiatry as it currently stands is a partial help. Um, scientific psychology, um, neuroscience, they're all partially helpful, very helpful. Um, but they simply seem to be quite enough to really make it through life's great challenges. And even if we weren't in a pandemic and an economic implosion that seems to be occurring around us, we all have incredible challenges to deal with in life. Whatever happens, people you love are going to die. Um, in the last week, my grandmother, incredibly powerful influence on my life and many other people's lives, died um, of pneumonia, possibly um, caused by the virus, but certainly contextually um, I think she saw the future of being isolated in her home without anyone visiting, um, and that really influenced where she was at. Um, we all have to deal with this loss, this grief, this pain. Um, we'll be probably sick at some point. People we love will probably be sick. We'll probably lose our job. We'll probably potentially lose our business. Um, and all the training of life, of, of, of self-development, comes into its own in these moments. They're so rich and beautiful. It's easy to feel enlightened and conscious and connected on a Goan beach um, or an Ibethan terrace, all loved up, dancing around, um, or when things are going really well in our team, where we just nailed something uh, with our business, just launched a product that's really getting traction. Those are the easy times. What all the practice of life, the practices that we call transformation practices or reconnection practices, are there so that we can be transformational, transformative, adaptive, creative, powerful, purposeful, conscious of value in these moments. And bliss is optional. We usually get bliss too, but it is optional. Pleasure, happiness is optional. It's not a part of genuine personal transformation because feelings of pleasantness, happiness will come, go, they'll move through us. And there'll be lots of feelings of grief and pain and suffering um, and challenge too. And they're all part of the conversation. Um, so we can be fully thriving in life. This is a key uh, idea in biotransformation theory. We can be fully thriving and not be happy in the moment. But we can always be meaningful, always be conscious, always be growing, always becoming more of who we are, and most importantly, always being of service. 
So I realized science didn't have all the answers. Um, Biotransformation 3 has three great rivers running into it um, as an ocean of wisdom and knowledge, which I don't think of my, as mine, by the way. It's just something I've either brought together the work of others, lots of other people, the shoulders of thousands of giants um, of all sorts. Um, I sort of brought it together, curated it would be a better understanding, um, and perhaps channeled some of it in some way. Uh, and again, we'll come onto that in later videos. So tra science isn't enough. Science is a great um, lens to look through um, at the objective world. We look out from our body and we go out into the objective world of objects and we measure them. And that's how science was developed. Um, it was a way of saying that we can't always tell what's going on uh, through our own subjective biases and, 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 and things. So let's measure it, do lots of measurement on lots of different objects, and then come up with some theories, some grounded knowledge. And science is the best way we have developed yet as a human species to understand the hard world of objects, these things. Um, science is great for understanding um, hard objects, certainly um, how they interact and move, if not exactly what they are. Um, but it's less good at understanding human beings, and there's a number of reasons for that. One, science studies tend to study very small phenomena because it's very hard to study psychology, human beings in the world. Too many variables, so it cuts out loads of variables to focus on one thing or two things or three things. Most of the studies have been done with um, Anglo-Saxon, Caucasian, um, middle upper class students of psychology de departments. Um, they're quite hard to replicate. Um, but above all, science developed as a study of what Galileo called primary properties, primary qualities, so speed, mass, um, acceleration, um, density, width, height, etc. And at that point, science chose not to study the so-called secondary qualities. Um, interesting that they were called secondary. Um, subjective experience. It didn't say they're not important or not real, it just said we can't really make a science of subjective experience, so we're just not going to try to. So the scientific tradition, as we currently have it in the West, went from avoiding studying consciousness, subjective experiences, qualia, um, experience of feeling happy, sad, guilt, grief, um, enlightenment, creativity, um, to actually now discounting those experiences. And some philosophers of science, some philosophers of consciousness, and a lot of scientists discount all this rich experience that goes on inside us as illusory, um, at best delusory at worst. And all we are are brain cells firing, um, which doesn't account for a number of things like creativity, it doesn't account for a number of things like love and peace, um, it doesn't account for us being able to freely, free will change things as leaders. Um, uh, it doesn't account for how thoughts uh, through the placebo effect can um, influence physical reality of our biology and many more things. And by the way, these video videos are not edited. Um, there's no script. Um, there's no production team here, as I usually would have. There's just me, and there's gonna be bloopers and mistakes and whatever. It's just real coming through right now. So if you, science can tell you a lot about the neurons of your brain, the neurons of your second brain, the gut, um, it can tell you that we have things like somatic markers that seem to fire um, when we're reminded of intense experiences. It seems to it be able to t can tell you um, that there are lots of um, bacteria in the gut that seem to influence our, our mind. It can tell you that amazingly the vagus nerve that we thought I was taught told your brain, told your body what to do with the vagus nerve. A lot of the fibers of the vagus nerve seem to go upwards new news, um, influencing our thinking through our body, um, through experience called interoception, um, which we'll come on to. Um, so science tells you all those things, but it tells you very little um, about our conscious experience. Um, and in fact, science has to be a science of many things, and a lot of times our conscious, ex conscious experience is experience of us. I can't ever get into your consciousness. Um, I can only master my own, experience my own. So a second tradition has developed longer than science. Science has only been around for a few hundred years. Some people can trace it back to um, the Greeks, maybe even um, before. Um, but as we currently know, only a few hundred years. But there's another science 
Um, and science really means knowledge originally, scienza. Um, there's another science that have become called the contemplative sciences or the meditative sciences. Um, I call them the wisdom traditions, um, where individual philosophers, thinkers, practitioners have been studying their own consciousness um, for an entire lifetime, over many lifetimes, over millennia. And those individual philosophers, thinkers, teachers, poets have developed a body of knowledge uh, which is our treasure trove, it's all our birthrights to have this knowledge, um, which we now call wisdom or philosophy, um, philosophy literally meaning philosophy, philosophia, um, the love of wisdom. And it's kind of like wisdom about how to live life um, and includes with it practices for how to understand that wisdom. Um, and there's even philosophers of philosophy or historians of philosophy who think that um, even the Greeks that we thought are so rational were actually doing this kind of wisdom philosophy, how to live your life well, how to deal with life. And that may be the Stoics, um, the Stoicism, it can be um, the Taoists in China, um, it can be Buddhism, it can be Sufism, Kabbalah, mysticism, um, German mysticism, Anglo-Saxon, American, it can be um, uh, the Transcendentalists, it can be um, people like Emerson in, in, in the US. Um, and they all come to the similar understanding of how to engage with life. Um, and I'll share some of that. So that's the first river of biotransformation theory is science, the science of um, our bodies mainly, but I also study and keep up with system science, the science of complex, um, often biological, but not always adaptive systems, um, the science of crowds, the science of networks, um, but mainly the science of, of neurobiology. Um, and I still read the primary papers uh, every month. I read 20 or 30 of the ones I think are most interesting. Second river of the knowledge of biotransformation theory is, is the wisdom traditions, deep readings of um, Advaita Vedanta, Sufism, Buddhism, etc. Not just the theories, but then putting them into practice in my own experience, generating my own wisdom through their lenses. And that's the gaze inside. So we've got a gaze outside of objective reality and studying that scientifically, rigorously. And then we've got a gaze inside of our consciousness, and that's the contemplative sciences, the wisdom traditions, and I've been bringing those together for 20 years, which has been, by the way, a fairly thankless task, um, because a lot of the science lovers don't think a lot about spirituality uh, and wisdom, um, and downgrade it, and um, disregard it, and laugh at it, and a lot of the spiritual people um, don't like um, objective thinking, the science of things like vaccines uh, for viruses, um, a lot of conspiracy theorists around what science is and isn't. But I've been trying to find the triangulation points, the sort of intersection points between um, the science and the spirituality piece, because I believe there's only one reality, not two or three or five. I think there are different flavours of it, and that's going to be biotransformation theory gem two. Um, only one reality, therefore the science and the consciousness studies have to intersect somehow. They have to be um, connect. So I've been trying to piece those connections together over many, many years, hours, days, not 10,000 hours, oh, 10,000, uh, 1,000 hours, um, you know, 10, 12 hour days often, um, balanced with living it in my life with my beautiful boys and, and family and friends and loved ones and team. But those two gazes give you, um, an understanding of your inner reality and your outer reality, but what they don't do is then allow you to create concrete, practical, tangible change. And so the third great river that runs through biotransformation theory is from my work as a actual practitioner of change. So I've run my own business since I was 24, um, and I've learned a hell of a lot about what actually has to occur for practical things like having salary money in the bank, um, having projects actually occur on time to budget and to some level of excellence. Uh, in that time, I've actually been an entrepreneur of change, helping over 150 large organizations, various startups, big um, institutions, government departments of massive countries change themselves too, practically, like things are different on the ground. People are behaving differently, they're thinking differently, and they're feeling differently. And including that, the science or the practice of mass behavior change, which I learned through doing advertising for companies like PlayStation, where we consciously chose um, 
to shift the mindsets and behaviors around something like video gaming, going from people thinking it was a small uh, pastime for teenage boys to being now a dominant culture of the world in which actually makes more money than Hollywood um, and where something like 45% of all gamers are now women. That was a change that was created by people. Uh, along that way, I've done lots of coaching of others, of myself, um, run, I don't know how many days of leadership development programs, how many days of innovation programs, really big, difficult, challenging, and high profile change programs. And so I've wrapped all that thinking around personal change, psychotherapy, coaching, CBT, all that kind of stuff with changing teams, organizations, with changing systems. I've worked on various different systems transformation programs um, with nonprofits like Oxfam and WWF um, and people like that. Um, and that's the third great river in biotransformation theory. So a question you might be asking is why share this now? Why this video series now? And it's a very personal set of reasons. One of the reasons BTT is called BTT, obviously it's transformation theory, but it's biotransformation theory. It's rooted in biology. Um, and bios in Greek means life. It's rooted in life, real life, um, and our real biologies. And our biologies being also psychologies, um, and how biology shift and change and can be led or free will chosen to change is because bio also represents something called known as um, biodynamic theories or biodynamic practices. And for me, biodynamic means responding to the live moment now with the most appropriate, valuable, conscious, purposeful response that keeps us adapted to the world, fitting the world. Um, you can tell there's some evolutionary theory running through this uh, BTT. And right now we're in this inflection point. And um, there's some very personal things going on for me too. So um, I mentioned my grandmother, I think I mentioned my grandmother died, maybe of the pandemic flu, certainly didn't want to be on her own for months. Um, that's a big thing for me. But I've also had of my two sons, one has had um, the corona cough, uh, a virus, uh, temperature, been off school, um, little lad. Uh, and the other was in A&E, accident emergency, the ER, um, a week before the lockdown started with breathing issues, with respiratory issues. Um, thankfully, he's OK right now. Um, so I'm really present to the fact that my two little people, um, who are so much of my world, um, are in danger. I'm very present to my parents uh, being in the vulnerable groups. I'm very aware of myself and my wife, partner, business partner, co-creator. Um, I'm also at risk right now. Um, and so biodynamically, um, really asking what is this moment calling for? And yes, it's calling for... Um, business adaptation, my own work, um, but it called me to gift these videos um, of service. The best thing I can do is help people respond, adapt creatively, take this thing in that's happening to us and turn it into something that happened. we happen to it uh, in our work, in our families, in our organisations, in our communities, um, our villages, our towns, our local supermarket. Um, and that's why now. Um, so this is also um, a kind of, I guess, posterity set of videos um, of my thinking, which I've never done in one place before. So, um, and also I should be out, you know, clear that our business is at threat. My livelihood, something I've put my whole life uh, into uh, for 21 years is now very much at threat. Um, I may not be here in six months. So that's why now. Um, and I thought, okay, what's the moment calling for? What's seeking to emerge from me in this moment, as well as adapting the business, securing my kids, um, securing our livelihoods, um, a sharing. And that's why I realized a sharing of my work. Um, and this may be the last set of videos I ever make. I don't know. Well, no one knows. Um, but it feels like important enough to do this now. So um, one of the key principles of BTT, biotransformation theory, is that no one has the answer to what's happening. Um, right now, this pandemic, this economic collapse, what's happening in your business, in your family, in your life. Um, but what we can do and what BTT teaches us is to live 
the questions now and answer them through living them, through experiencing them fully and really bringing our whole selves to them. Um, and that's a, a quote from the poet Rainer Maria Rilke, live the questions now, because we're not ready for the answers. We're not there yet. We haven't gone through the transformation journey. Um, and BTT is basically a way of engaging with the transformation uh, journey that is being invited by every crisis, not just this big pandemic, any crisis, personal crisis, uh, financial crisis, health crisis, um, losing your job crisis, um, difficulty with your family at home crisis. So during my explanation of how we can engage with the pandemic, with the corona crisis pandemic, um, please relate what I'm doing to um, what is relevant for you because BTT is agnostic. It doesn't have any answers, um, but it helps you ask and answer the questions for you where you are as a leader, as an individual in your sphere, the systems you touch with your life. Um, there are no silver bullets for the life. There are no silver bullets for personal life. There are no silver bullets for organizational futures or systemic futures. No one's got the answer. They can go, oh, great. I got, if I just do this, um, if you meditate and just do this, that will solve all your problems. If you have some kind of exotic healing, that will solve all your problems. If you just think positively, if you, you do digital transformation in your business, if you use AI, um, if we use socialism, no one's got the answer because all those ideas are from the past. And we can use them and include them and, and, and reconstitute them and innovate with them, but the future's coming from the future. We haven't lived it yet. Um, so we have to bring ourselves fully into presence with the future and allow the past and the future to interact within us. Um, and that gives birth from chaos, um, breakthroughs that transform lives, really life-changing and world-changing breakthroughs. So just to finish off this vid, I'm going to share with you the seven gems of biotransformation theory, and then uh, we'll start engaging in the full pandemic uh, with the next vid. So the first principle is the unified nature of our mind and our body, not two things, one thing. Um, and deeper into this principle is the unified nature of our mind and our body with the universe, nature, life itself, uh, a principle that many will know um, as non-duality. Things are not two, they are some way one, and I'll go further into all these uh, in the future videos. The second principle is the two modes of consciousness, of being that we all have access to, and I'm going to share with you some really interesting um, stuff from um, the latest neuroscience of creativity, of imagination, uh, really latest, latest stuff, um, and how it touches fully into some of the great wisdom traditions around these two modes of consciousness that we get access to at any point. Um, the third is the principle of the third way, and this basically says, yes, there are two modes, there are two polarities, two extremes, love and hate, purpose and profit. Um, but the third way says that we can bring through ourselves as wise people, as, as wise and transformational people, as leaders, we can bring two polarities together and live them in a creative harmony, uh, what we call a palintonic harmony of two things, where it's not either or, it's both and. And this is not some kind of vanilla, beige, central position uh, that compromises. You're actually going to a higher uh, common factor between these two polarities in your third way. And we'll come back to that lots. The fourth principle are the four H's or the four uh, elements of every human experience. Every organizational moment has four H's involved. And by splitting uh, a complex reality into four pieces, we can get to change it better. Um, and those four H's just for you for now uh, are our hands, which represent our behaviors, our actions. Well, you could see if you video someone, um, your head, uh, your beliefs, stories, narratives, um, assumptions. Um, the third H is your heart, your emotional states, your feelings and getting more granular and a deeper range of emotions. And the fourth H is from a Zen term for our gut, for our sensational feelings, um, right from our pelvic floor, usually right up to our throat, sometimes our head and our lower down too, which we call the Hara. Um, and every organization always has four H's working. Every human being always has four H's working. The fifth principle are the five stages of human adult development. And I've been building on the work of many great thinkers like Piaget um, and at Harvard, um, 
Robert Keegan um, and others um, and adding and nuancing five stages of conscious development um, that we can go on to become more transformational. Uh, the sixth gem is the six spirals uh, of engagement that every problem or, or challenge um, uh, invites us to do, starting right from ourselves, right moving out to systems. We spiral through these six um, steps or spirals. And the seventh gem is the seven steps of the transformation curve. Apologize for my writing on boards. Uh, I was a teacher once in Africa using chalk and I never really cracked how to make it look beautiful. Um, and I'm going to leave you with this last um, bit more on this last gem because every problem, every opportunity, every challenge, every crisis, every issue, every um, pain moment is a, a choice point between two paths, a bifurcation point. Um, and I'm going to draw what I call the transformation curve here. Uh, and we're going to go deep into what this is and how it works and learning loads from it. Um, so we're here, we realize something isn't working. Um, isn't good as pain, suffering, challenge. And ideally, we choose consciously to go on a transformation curve journey, which looks something like this. And I'll explain more and more about it uh, in future videos. Or we try and deny, decline, disassociate, deny, uh, so that, repress, um, pretend it's not there, be right about it, whether it's be right from a spiritual platitude way it's all good or whether it's uh, actually it's not really a problem because uh, we're okay we're just going to carry on doing what we did and try and get back to where we were and I call that the breakdown decline and it looks better at the beginning because you're sort of carrying on a little bit as, as the way things are but soon declines pretty quickly lack of fit with the world lack of match with the world and we get a decline we fade we get symptoms of failure coming up we underperform um, we suffer we go into ever decreasing circles uh, and eventually we have a big old fail down there somewhere which could be our suicide um, it could be the implosion of our business or our marriage um, and between the two we have this transformation differential which is the difference in outcome concrete outcome from us deciding whether to engage fully in transformation that's being invited by the moment um, or deny, um, repress, pretend, disassociate, um, panic um, uh, and just try to not engage in transformation. So um, I think that's all for me for this first video. Um, I hope it's been of value, already covered a lot of ground. I will go through all this again and much deeper and nuance all these different thoughts and ideas. But I wanted to set the scene for the future videos in this series um, and give you a sense of whether it's worth, frankly, watching the rest. Um, so the next video will be about how to take stock in a crisis, um, how to deal with shock, um, what the appropriate response is to something this big, um, and some practices and some mindsets we can use to start this transformation curve, but not too quickly. We don't want to start busy adapting when we're in shock, when we're grieving, when we're dealing with difficult emotions. Um, and we'll come on to that in the next video. So hopefully uh, see you in a moment.